I'm Jasmine Moradi, and you're listening to the Queens of Tech podcast, a podcast series about workplace role models, where I get the opportunity to ask 60 plus questions to female influencers about their journey into STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. My vision with this podcast is to raise the workplace ecosystem for women in tech. My mission is to bridge the gap between schools and workplaces by highlighting female role models in STEM to encourage more young girls and women to unleash their full potential in these fields to reach top leadership roles. In this episode, I'm very excited to welcome my guest, Tonya Makovsky, network engineer and front-end support at Flying Buttress. Hi, Tonya. Hi. I'm very happy to have you joining me today. I am so excited. How are you? I'm really great. This is the first day of my four-day birthday weekend. My birthday is on Monday, so this is a great kickoff. Happy birthday. Thank you. Now, let us dive into your journey into STEM. Hope you're ready for the Queens of Tech 60 plus questions. I am ready. Let's warm up with a few fun facts about you. How would you describe your personality in three hashtags? Hashtag I am the IT guy, hashtag wrangler of chaos, and hashtag bitches get shit done. How would you describe your life in three sentences? Our productivity is not our worth. Any progress is better than nothing, and perfection is the enemy of progress. What kind of music stimulates and motivates you the most? Hip hop and rap, it's my favorite. What is your personal motto? Help the people that come behind you. What is your favorite book? Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. What is your favorite podcast? I picked two, one serious and one funny. I've been listening to What Can Roman Mars Learn About Constitutional Law? And then Everything is Alive. It's hilarious. Check it out. Mac or PC? For my personal use, I like Mac. When I'm fixing other people's computers, I hope it's a PC. Say something interesting about you that most people don't know. I throw axes. What is your hidden talent? I have a really good ability to make money. If you were going to write a book about your life, what would the title be? Nevertheless, she persisted. Amazing. Now, let us dig deeper. Our childhood has an effect on our adulthood. Our early experiences shape our belief about ourselves, others, and the world. Now, I want to discover your childhood. Where did you grow up? I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area. What was your dream job as a child? I think I wanted to be a veterinarian. What was your favorite subject in school? Probably music, because I did it the longest elementary school all the way through post-college. What was your least favorite subject? Math. (laughs) I was so slow at it. What is your earliest memory of technology and the arrival of the internet? My mom brought home extra old computers from work, and we got to play with that. And really, I used it like as an electronic diary while my friend was learning how to French braid my hair. And then in high school, when the internet was starting to be more easily accessible to everybody, we used to log on to chat rooms and like connect to universities and be like, look, we're in the university library, which seems silly now. (laughs) Which were the three first technology gadgets you owned? used computer from my mom's office. I had a pager when I was in high school. I had a Motorola StarTac cell phone. That was my first cell phone in like 1999. And then when I was in college, I had an old laptop, which I thought was revolutionary because I could do my coursework in the student lounge and not have to wait until I got home because efficiency. Who was your favorite female role model growing up and why? It has always been my mom. She doesn't back down and gets everything done and is motivational and has taught me everything I know about writing resumes and how to negotiate your job. And I try to teach those things to the women that I encounter in my life because they've been invaluable to me. How do you think where you grew up and the school you went to and the generation you come from influence your education and career choice? I think because computers became so much more common and the internet became so much more common, it seems easy to people of my generation or certainly easier. It wasn't learning a new thing. The old dogs can't learn new tricks kind of situation. So it was easy for me to pick up. And I noticed a lot of value in teaching the older generation how to do things when they were trying to transition into computers and electronic tools in the workplace. I'm like, oh yeah, that's easy. It's really efficient once you learn it. That's how my career path really took the turn for technology. Amazing. 
Now, I'm going to read two quotes. First one, how does the universe expect me to choose a career path at 16? I can't even choose what I want for dinner. Second, Abraham Lincoln said, I quote, the best way to predict your future is to create it. So Tonya, I want to know the choices behind your career path. What did you study at university? I had two college experiences. The first one, I was studying philosophy and political science, but then got, I don't know, disenfranchised after the American 2020 election. That was a debacle. And so when I went back again, I decided to study computer science with an emphasis in data management, specifically because the data you put in is as good as the data you're going to get out. And I really wanted to jump in front of bad practices in workplaces and control that because I feel like it brings businesses down. Who and what influenced you to get into your chosen field? I don't really know. I saw other people doing it and making money and working from home. I was like, oh, that's easy. I can do that. What professional roles have you had before that led you to your current one? The role that moved me into technology was, and I don't remember what the position was called, but for an organization, a nonprofit called Wardrobe for Opportunity, where I was working on client scheduling for appointments where people would get dressed for work. They would get interview clothing for no cost, and then they could come back when they got a job for a week's worth of clothing that they can wear in a professional environment. I was mostly answering phones and scheduling things, but I was working with an older generation of people on computers that were donated, and it was technology chaos. I saw a bunch of ways to improve that. Implemented off-site backup servers, so everything was in a centralized location, off-site backup, so that way they weren't losing data. A database that was built for the way that they did business, so they could track things and generate metrics. And I thought, wow, this really is transformational and made this business possible to be functional and to help these women. I want to do this all the time, and that's mostly what I do now. What does Flying Buttress do and what is your title? Flying Buttress is a managed service provider. That's a fancy way of saying IT support. And we work primarily for the architectural engineering design and construction vertical. So architectural companies primarily. My role is officially network engineer, but primarily my job is front end PC support. I sit at a help desk basically all day and help people fix Autodesk, reset their passwords, keep people working basically. How did you get the job and what are your main responsibilities? I have always been the accidental techie, again, going back to that nonprofit where I just knew the most about it and wasn't, don't make people feel bad about having a problem with computers. People are like, oh, I'm so bad at computers. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm so bad at accounting. You do accounting, I'll do computers. So it's been easy for me to get along with people and help them when they're feeling bad about themselves about having this problem. Good customer service helps. And then in my interview, I'm the only technical woman at my company. They were like, are you able to work with a bunch of bros? And I said, that as a woman in technology, that's primarily my career experience. Bring it. What does a typical workday look like for you? Everything is tickets first. Like we're always waiting first thing in the morning for things that have come in overnight or over the weekend. And we can also then advance as things slow down after tickets. We can advance client projects and tasks and things like that. And then maybe third to internal projects and make ourselves better. But tickets. I love to quote, choose a job you love and you will never have to work a day in your life. So Tonya, what do you love about your role? I really appreciate the fact that IT keeps everything going and our role is primarily to make other people's jobs easier and more efficient. I'm all about easy and efficient. They are hopefully less frustrated after having their problem solved. What is the best experience you've had in your role so far? I have a client that we took on, I think we onboarded them. I can't remember if it was January, February, March of 2020. Then I never got to see them in person. Their elevator was broken for a while and I couldn't go up four flights of stairs at that time. And so I didn't see them in person for a long time. But eventually when we were going into the office, they would see me walking around the office in the background and then cheer, oh, and, and, and Tanya's here. And I was like, oh, <laughs> thanks guys. And what is the biggest challenge you've encountered so far and how did you tackle it? trying to organizing tasks across clients. It's really interesting to deal with one business's IT problems and be really good at that, but applying that six, seven, eight times and being able to integrate ourselves and then their processes into our workflow has been challenging. But standardizing documentation, I even have a shirt that says document or die, and trying to automate as many things as possible makes it easier. What do you wish everybody understood about your role? 
IT people need breaks. Hey, can I remote in 1.30? And they're like, my computer's available at noon or after five. And I'm like, I have to eat. And I also have to leave at five because I have a family or just need to stop working. What is the common myth about your profession or field that you want to disapprove? We're not all guys. <laughs> people sometimes reply back and they're like, thanks, Tony. And I'm like, okay, you're welcome. Fine. What do you love about working in the tech industry? IT and tech in general in this era really makes everything else possible. We do everything on computer. Computers. So that feels pretty great. And ideally, we're making the world better all the time in our jobs. That feels motivational to me. And this is a real easy way to do that because it influences everything. Oprah Winfrey said, I quote, Think like a queen. A queen is not afraid to fail. Failure is another stepping stone to greatness. So Tonya, what have by far been your biggest achievement in your career? like small businesses because I feel like I can make the greatest impact and I oftentimes walk in and they are doing things in a really discordant antiquated way and I'm like hey we can streamline this and make this data available all the time and automate a lot of these processes and it's mind-blowing and really transformational for these businesses increasing efficiency and making people's jobs easier is good for business but also good for people what is the biggest factor that has helped you become successful and your success habits I really like lists and prioritizing things, really. We are each only one person and can only do so much. And at work and really in our personal lives, there's an infinite amount of things that can be done. So making lists, prioritizing the things that need to be done because they're critical or urgent or take a long time, and then asking for help and asking others if they need help is a good success habit for anything, anytime you're working with other people. How do you measure your own performance at work? I'm a number cruncher and my business doesn't necessarily crunch numbers. And so I watch the number of tickets that we have open for a given client and the percentage of the open tickets that are on my plate and per client tickets. And sometimes I'll pop in and look at tickets for other people and see, has this been addressed for the clients that I'm primarily responsible for to try to keep things moving? We're supposed to be closing tickets all the time and advancing projects, but we have a, a feedback process when you close a ticket they get an email to rate it and sometimes they're mad because it took a long time to solve this problem because the software is challenging or their computer is broken and it's frustrating for them but sometimes they write these really nice reviews that are just warm and fuzzy so I read those as a measure of customer satisfaction and the fact that I'm being personable at my job but also to keep me motivated because sometimes it gets hard and I'm frustrated and I read those like warm fuzzy notes I save them put them in a file so I can read them later on hard days what is your biggest failure in your career and what did you learn from it? At one point in my second degree, I learned as many programming languages as this program would offer me. So I had a lot of rudimentary knowledge in a lot of places. And I thought, oh, I could apply this to anything. And I took a job as a junior FileMaker developer. FileMaker is like an access database, but for Mac, it's owned by Apple or a subsidiary now of Apple. And honestly, I hated that software. And when I think back on it, I really hate making access databases. And so I should have known better, but I hated it. And I was really not good at it. I made myself a database and now I have this database, but boy, oh, I, <laughs> I really did not enjoy it. What is inspiring and motivating you the most in your role and career right now? I really enjoy improving business process and efficiency. In my role, I have the opportunity not only to do that for my employer, but also for all of the client companies that I'm working with. That really keeps me coming back every day. Make it better. We can be better. Let us now jump into the influence of mentorship and role models. Role models can consciously or subconsciously be a powerful force in our lives. In addition, mentors can guide us through a career journey and open up a world of possibilities. Tonya, do you have a mentor today? I don't really have one mentor. My mom, she proofreads everything for me and keeps me going, but I really have leaned into communities instead of individual people. Who's the female role model you look up to in your field? I have two organizations that I just adore. One of them is Lesbians Who Tech. They're a global company and they just hosted a summit in San Francisco and they're fabulous. The people in that community are super smart, really forward thinking, really trying to build a better community, more diversity in tech and doing amazing things. And then my second organization is Tech Ladies, which is how I met you. They're very similar, also a global organization of very smart women who are very specifically all trying to help each other, which I use them because I'm the only female 
at my company, I use them as female coworkers. And so they're a good sounding board. And when I'm frustrated, I can go in and talk to them and they're not telling me that I'm being emotional. They're like, oh no, that's really challenging. And I see how you're frustrated by that. Cheers to both of them. Amazing. I love that. History shows that it has been more common for men having mentors and role models in business than women. How important do you think is to have a role model or a mentor or a community during one's career? I think it's incredibly valuable. It helps guide you to the best ways to grow your career. Having somebody with perspectives is incredibly valuable. And I don't know, imposter syndrome is a real thing. And so a mentor will see you for your value in a way that you can't and will remind you that, oh no, it's a hard day. You're not a bad person. It's a bad situation. And where sometimes when you're just thinking about your own perspective, you can get bogged down, I think the way that women are in their relationships, it would make sense to me that they would be more likely to have mentors. So applying that to our business lives just makes sense. Beautiful. Let us move on to leadership. Shirley Samber, CEO of Facebook said, I quote, leadership is about making others a result of your presence and making sure that the impact lasts in your absence. Tonya, what does leadership mean to you? I really actually resonate with that quote by Sheryl Sandberg because the idea of making change that outlasts you, that applies to a business. Of course, we want to make a business better, but the people that you are doing that business with, making their lives better. One of the principles of agile project management is psychological safety in the workplace. And when I first heard that, I was like, oh gosh, don't be silly. That's a ridiculous concept. But then I thought, no, wait a minute, making a place where it's safe for people to ask for help and certainly offer help to each other or to say, no, I can't take that on right now I've got too many things or let's just schedule that out is incredibly valuable and introducing those concepts to businesses is revolutionary honestly what do you consider a good versus a bad leader bad leaders are inconsistent and I guess that translates into unreliable it's not having clear ideas about what the company's goals are and how an individual person fits into that and then how the team can do that together and then I think also not giving people the space to do those things because you've obviously hired them because you respect their skills and abilities let them do it don't stand in their way while those are the qualities of bad leadership contrarily the good side is inspiring people to do their best work. I've been real deep in the project management training mindset recently, and we were talking about how to form teams about the storming and norming part of it and then performing. A good leader will recognize that changes in a workflow or in the team membership is going to change the way that things are happening and changing that growth opportunity and then locking in how this team works together and then how to grow it and be better. The sum is greater than the individual parts. Who's your favorite female tech leader and why? I don't know. There are so many good ones to pick from. Edie Windsor both was a technologist that I think IBM early on and was revolutionary in the IT industry, but also was one of the named people in the lawsuit that ultimately went to the U.S. Supreme Court for marriage equality. Her career life and her personal life were both big and influential, and that's amazing. And then second, I can't just pick one, is Megan Smith. She was the third U.S. CTO, but I think the first woman to hold that position. And she's big in the Lesbians Who Tech community as well, and so she speaks at these events and things like that. But having a woman at that level making decisions about technology for for the U.S. in a greater sense really is amazing. How would you describe yourself as a leader? I try to be kind and I try to always thank people. I shouldn't assume that because there has been a task assigned or it is their job that they shouldn't be thanked for their time and effort. And so I always try to thank people and ask people if they need help. Sometimes it feels, and I think for women and for men as well, it feels uncomfortable to be overwhelmed or stressed out at work and ask for help. And so if you can get ahead of that and say, hey, how's everybody doing? Does anybody need help with anything? Creates that psychological safety in the workplace. And as a leader, what values are most important to you? Really valuing people as individuals more than process or the business itself. If you hire people because you know they're good, then get out of the way of them and let them be good. Don't work them to death. What leadership lessons have you learned that formed you into the leader you are today? 
I've been in a couple of companies or had some clients where the leadership were, I'm going to say hostile, like yellers. We always say, oh, he's a yeller. And it makes people uncomfortable and scared in the workplace. And I don't want to be that. It just seems like a poor quality in people and just like really silly to do at work. Where at work? Can't you be an adult? What are your three strengths and three weaknesses? I care a lot about the outcome of what I do. I guess I take it personally. The success of things that I work on are incredibly important to me, which maybe is also one of my weaknesses. I'm incredibly persistent. I feel like I can find a solution to anything given enough time and effort. I always have a plan A, plan B, plan C, plan Q. And servant leadership, it's a phrase that I've really appreciated where it's not top down. It really is supportive and I like it a lot. For weaknesses, I'm just going to say again, I sometimes I care too much. I get a little bit frustrated by immobility. People have told me that they can see it on my face. And so sometimes I will just call into a meeting instead of be on the video. We're all here doing something together. Are we going to do this or what? My third one is I end up running myself down and then typing. Sometimes I'm a chaotic typer and I don't slow down and check for typos. Let us now jump into the hottest topic in business today. Workplace culture, unlocking the power, diversity, equality, inclusion, and belonging. Tonya, what does diversity, quality, inclusion, and belonging mean to you personally? I feel like we as a culture know what this means. For me personally, it's identifying where we're lacking and then fixing it for that particular business, but in a lasting way so it impacts future generations. What do you consider being three to five signs of good company culture if you were to join a company? I always read through a company's website. I look their leadership. A lot of times there's photographs. Are they all cis, het, white guys? That's important to me. Transparency and communication. Really, that is salary and job postings. I'm really excited that it's becoming law, I think, now in New York and California and a couple of other places in the U.S. I also try to speak with people during my interview process about tenure at a company. How long have people been there? If there's a lot of turnover, it's probably not a good place to work. As a woman, what has been the most significant barrier in your career and how have you overcome these challenges? I think imposter syndrome has been one of my biggest challenges. I'm short, so when people see me, sometimes they mistake me for a kid. Like when I went on a field trip recently, they said, are you one of the students here? And I was like, no, I'm a mom, which is hilarious to me. But sometimes I think that influences how people see me, even though I see myself differently. And so I overcome that. I've decided that I'm in this situation, this job, this forum, this speaking opportunity, because I have good skills skills and experience, and I should just do it. I'm there. I'm just going to start talking about the things that I have to say. Why do you think it's important for more women to join the tech industry, especially as leaders? Avoiding groupthink is primarily the reason for diversity in the workplace. A business can do nothing but gain from having more perspective and being more broadly attractive to the market and having more people contributing to the way a product or a service looks is how to do that. Sometimes I'm like, why don't we get that? <laughs> Do you and how do you speak with your colleagues about diversity, quality, inclusion and belonging challenges, especially salary gaps? I don't have any female colleagues currently. One of the biggest ways is trying to, anytime somebody asks me to look at a job listing, I'm like, are we going to put the salary range in there? Both in terms of not wasting people's time if it's a job that they can't apply for because it's offering less than they can take, but also because stating that amount of money makes it clear that everybody should be getting paid that. At one point, I worked for a company where one of the developers could crunch numbers in the employment database and did, and then we decided that we wanted to talk to the leadership about whether or not people were really getting paid equally. The outcome was a change in title and I possibly pay for her, but it started a conversation about whether or not our efforts really were equal and fair for people doing the same job. And title is sometimes just as important as pay equality because it's difficult to get the next job in your career path if you don't demonstrate you have done it. Being a senior and being recognized for that is also important. There are many public and internal discussions about the barriers women face from reaching higher positions in the tech industry. How do you feel it has affected and is affecting you? And what is your advice on how to best unlock these roadblocks? 
I hear a lot of statistics about who applies for jobs and the idea is that men will apply for a job if they mostly qualify for it when they're reading the job description and women may not. And I think applying for those jobs and talking in your cover letter and in your interview about why you are able to do those things, even if you can't demonstrate you've done it on your resume, back to what I just said about position and title, your ability sometimes isn't necessarily reflected in your job history. And then back to imposter syndrome again, just like you're there, you're good at what you do, you're capable, show up and speak up and do it. As the tech industry finds it hard to attract and retain women, what is your best advice or strategies for how companies can work to build a stronger corporate culture that engages gender diversity? It's important that we're actually doing things like we can't just have policies we have to have actions behind it and so if we recognize we need change we have to go do that change investing in training and mentorship or internship programs where we're reaching out to people who want to get into the industry and making it accessible for them is valuable programs like tectonica in san francisco does tech boot camps specifically for women and non-binary adults for this idea recruiting from spaces where diverse candidates are watching Posting jobs with organizations like Lesbians Who Tech and Tech Ladies where there are more diverse candidates. You have to go and find these people and you can't expect that they're going to show up in the places where you've showed up because those are closed loop systems. And then I think as far as like culture things, flexible work schedules, pay transparency, flexible work from home on location makes it possible for people to be humans and have a job. Sometimes appointments have to happen during business hours, but that doesn't mean that this person is not good at their job. And then showing people that you value them, there's a lot of ways that can happen. Acknowledging their effort at work, saying thank you, perks and time off and good pay, equal pay, all of those things remind them that their time and effort really is contributing to their business success and telling them that will make them better workers. What would you say are the few challenges and possibilities of implementing diversity, quality, inclusion and belonging culture in a workplace today? action, not just policies. We can sometimes spend a lot of time thinking about it and then writing these policies. And then it's just this black and white document oftentimes put up on a website, but there's no change in how we're doing things. And that inaction, I think, is the downfall of a lot of DEI efforts at companies. Why and how do you think companies would benefit from having workplace gender diversity, especially better gender representation at sea level? A lot of times when people, women are evaluating a job, they're looking at those pictures like I do when I'm looking at a job offer or a company that I might want to work for because that tells me a lot about what their culture and their policies, what their actions have been in the past. It also is going to reflect a better understanding of people in their business, in their company in general. There's more input and influence and thought happening around that. Any business that is considering broader category of information about their, their policies and their products are going to be better in general. How much do you think the industry has changed regarding this subject since you joined? I'm used to being the only woman doing tech things. And I haven't been nervous or shy about it necessarily, but it's hard for other people to do. And it's really been great to see that changing where more women are feeling less intimidated by being the only woman or being on a team where there are only a couple of women. I feel like we're empowering people to show up as their whole selves at work more. And that really includes having a different opinion or a different thought process than your coworkers. Looking back on your career, what one thing would you have changed in your working environment to break the bias? I would have started asking people to prioritize diversity earlier. Like I really didn't think about it and thought just my showing up in the workplace was enough. It's our responsibility to help the people that are coming behind us. And so if I felt that there wasn't enough diversity in the workplace, then I could have done more earlier about it and said, hey, we should have more training programs or reach out to people and do mentoring or have an intern who does IT for the summer and taken a more active role in changing that earlier rather than later. Then looking forward, what will you do as a leader to improve the bias for the next generation of women in tech? One of the things that my mom taught me was anytime there's something that you're interested in learning more about or you're interested in pivoting toward is to talk to people who have done it. They have insight and advice, but sometimes it's harder for people coming from disadvantaged communities to have that network already in place. Like you have to have a person to ask before you can ask the question. And a podcast like this gives people a free, easy way to listen to a data scientist from Google or a CEO 
CEO in France to ask these questions and to talk about their career path. And so your work is incredibly valuable. Oh, you're so sweet. Thank you for that. Let us move on to another hot topic in business today, which is workplace life balance and mental health. Tonya, you have without a doubt a busy lifestyle. How do you take care of yourself to maintain good mental health? Sometimes I'm not very good at owning a body and I have to actively, and really the my loved ones in my life help remind me of this, but I have to actively remind myself that I do in fact need to eat, sleep, exercise, and take breaks. And so I really try to prioritize that, mostly when I'm super stressed out. Oh, I've forgotten to do this. So have you ever experienced burnout? And if yes, how did you tackle it? I have a couple of times and it usually comes when I feel like everything is like skating along and under control and I'm like, oh, I can take on one more thing and then it causes chaos. For burnout, I want to recommend a book by, I think her name is Emily Nagasi, but it's called Burnout and it talked about completing the stress cycle, like there's the stress and the stressor and you have to allow yourself to be like, wow, that was really awful and that was really hard. Okay, that really emphasizes slowing down and that that we can only do as much as one person can do. We're not super people as much as we are super people. In those times, you gotta focus on the priorities. Sometimes being kind or being healthy and happy is more important than whatever your business goals might be. What motivates you every day to get out of bed? Quote from M from a song. He says, success is my only motherfucking option. Failure's not. And that really resonates with me because I'm going to do this. Like I am doing this and everything is going to be okay. And I just operate from that standpoint. And so I wake up and I'm like, okay, what am I doing today that is going to be successful? <laughs> what is your advice on how companies can create a more mentally healthy workplace in the new now? I think flexible work schedules, allowing people to slow down and be less productive when they're feeling that burnout edge, because when they can slow down and regain their composure, they're more effective, more accurate, more pleasant to work with. Encouraging breaks, encouraging the use of PTO, prioritizing people over processes, and good work will follow from that. Now, let us wrap up with a few words of wisdom and piece of advice for our listeners. Tonya, what is the best piece of advice you have been given that has helped you during setbacks in your role and career? I think as a woman, my inclination is to organize things for other people and schedule and take on administrative duties to keep things going, to keep the household running. But I think the best advice I've gotten is always focus on staying technical yourself. So I try to orient myself on that all the time. And then what is the worst advice you've ever been given and how did you tackle it? One time my mom and I went to a women's conference and I don't know what the topic was exactly. I was expecting like motivational speaking about women in the workplace and salary negotiation and improving your skills. But the door prizes for people were baskets of cleaning supplies and they literally said, get a husband. And my mom and I looked at each other, got up, left, laughed about it in the parking lot and got lunch. Okay, sometimes you need to know that's not the good advice. Is there something you wish you would have known or a skill you wish you had when starting out in the tech industry? Not necessarily. I feel like everything you can learn, positioning yourself in a way that is a growth mindset and not being afraid to learn and ask questions. If you had the ability to go back in time when you were just at the beginning of your career, what advice would you give to your younger self? I'm going to say more certifications. There's a lot of IT certifications. You can be a certified network engineer or a Cisco certified engineer or a Microsoft certified professional. And those things really have value as demonstrating your technical skills, but they also teach you those technical skills. And so sometimes it's challenging to get a job that catch 22. It's hard to get a job without experience, but you can't get the experience without the job. And training programs are a way to do that. What advice would you give to young girls and women wanting and trying to break into STEM fields today? If you like it, do it. Your interest and passion about it is gonna make you good at it. And don't be intimidated by the workplace because clearly you're good at it. Do it, you're great. Last but not least, what is next for you in your role and career in tech? What are your career aspirations? You know, everybody asks you, what's your five-year plan? And my plan really has been focused around getting my son through high school. Then I have more flexibility about where I can go. And so I'm like, what is Tanya gonna do? So I set a goal for myself early in 2022 that I'm gonna be a CTO or CIO by 2025. So we'll see how that goes. 
<laughs> I can't wait to interview when you reach that because I know you will. Thank you, Tanya, so much for being a guest on the Queens of Tech podcast. Sharing your journey will, without a doubt, inspire change and reshape company culture for the new generation of women in tech. Thank you, Jasmine. Thank you for listening. If you have worked in the tech industry a minimum of three years and would like to share your journey, please nominate yourself or somebody you know to i at jasminemoradi.com. For more podcast episodes and to learn more about the Queens of Tech initiative, and to support us, visit queensof.tech.